Welcome back, Warriors. Tunse Sego Anibuju, Kwe Ninda Luizi Pampometer, and I'm the host of this show, The Warrior Life. This podcast is a show about living the warrior life, a lifestyle that focuses on decolonizing our minds, bodies, and spirits, while at the same time revitalizing our cultures, traditions, laws, and governing practices. It's also about asserting, living, and defending our sovereignty all over Turtle Island. And this is the first podcast for 2022, and Happy New Year to everybody. I thought it would only be right on the first podcast of the new year to dedicate this podcast to my cousin, Candy Palmiter, who passed away unexpectedly on Christmas morning. My family is still in shock over the loss of Candy. She filled so many roles in our large extended Mi'kmaq family. She was a daughter, a sister, an auntie, a niece, and a cousin, and a friend to so many people. She also left a powerful legacy of love and compassion for our peoples. She wanted us to remember to love ourselves as we are and be the soft place to fall for our relatives, so many of whom are deeply traumatized by genocide. I searched my archives for any events that Candy and I did together so that I can share her voice with you. One of the very last events was a keynote lecture that I gave at the Atlantic Policy Congress of First Nations Chiefs, the APC, called the Atlantic Indigenous Health Conference, and that was held back in March of 2021. At the time, I was so lonesome for all of my friends and family members back home because of all of the travel restrictions related to the COVID-19 pandemic. So I was really excited when the APC reached out and asked me to be part of the event. At the time, I didn't know that my cousin Candy would be chairing the conference. So it was a nice surprise to see her face and hear her voice. It was hard not to get emotional when she introduced me, but it was the end of this session that I will always remember. After the keynote session that I gave, Candy chaired an extended question and answer session, but then she took a minute at the end of the whole event to talk about our granny. And we both ended up in tears and I am forever grateful for this moment. So here's my keynote lecture, the extended Q&A session that was chaired by Candy and the conversation that we had at the very end. I also think it's pretty nifty that on the very first day of this conference, we've got two Indigenous women giving keynotes. Both of them are PhDs. And you heard me refer to Dr. Brenda this morning, and I will refer to Dr. Pam this afternoon, because I have a little bone to pick. CBC has this thing where unless you are a doctor, as in a medical doctor, they don't put the DR when you appear and it miss me every time I see Pam on CBC, which is a lot, and there isn't the DR. I feel like she did the work to earn the damn thing. The least they could do is acknowledge it. But I will get off my soapbox so that we can get on with the main event of the afternoon. As I mentioned this morning, all of the biographical information for all the presenters are available on the website. I'm not including all that in the introduction. I'm just gonna give you title to the presentation um, and also the person's position. Also, if you have questions, uh, Dr. Pam's gonna speak until about 15 minutes to the end of her time, and then she will stop for questions. I will be monitoring the chat section, and I will bring up any questions that come into uh, play. I'll ask them. Uh, so any questions you have during the, during the talk, just put them in the chat down below. We'll monitor that, and we'll get them out to, uh, to Pam once she's done giving her talk. So now without further ado, your last keynote of the day, it's not the last thing of the day because at the end there's gonna be some awards presentation, but your last keynote of the day is gonna be a very interesting one called Confronting Systemic Racism in Healthcare Through First Nations Governance. And that is brought to you by Dr. Pamela Palmiter, who is the Chair of Indigenous Governance at Ryerson University. So without any further ado, I turn it over to you, Dr. Pam. Okay, can everybody see me and hear me? We can see you, we can hear you, your earrings are kicking. Oh, <laughs> thanks, you gotta support Native businesses. And thanks for that introduction, Candy. That's my pet peeve too. And sometimes on other television stations, they do it inconsistently. So all the guys will be introduced as doctor and their academics, but I'll be miss. Oh <laughs> like, yeah. What? Come on. No shock there, we'll keep complaining about it. <laughs> 
and I also think it's cool that you're doing all the emceeing. So, um, uh, Quay, family, friends, and relations. I am a member of Ugbaganjig, which is Eel River First Nation, part of the sovereign Mi'kmaq Nation on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. And I also grew up really close to our sister nation, the Wollastaque, and we've had lots of really strong social and political relations. And I think the same can really be said in the Atlantic region for all of the nations that we border with, you know, whether it's Passamaquoddy or Innu or other people. And I really wish I could actually be there right now because with these events in the Atlantic region comes lots of food. You get to do all the shopping of all of the earrings and beading and all of that work and hugs. I mean, it's all the lineups for hugs after events. That's my favorite. But right after the pandemic, I'll, I'll probably have to move home for a little bit. But today I'm coming to you from the sovereign territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog, who are facing their own crisis right now with the Ontario government trying to destroy the wetlands that are on their treaty territory without consulting with them. And I think it's really important to acknowledge wherever we are that we're standing in solidarity against any injustice against our people. Um, so like Candy said, today I'm going to be talking to you about the widespread racism in the healthcare system it's devastating impacts on our health and even our lifespan and the ways in which, you know, even systemic racism being character characterized as against indigenous peoples doesn't really acknowledge that it is the vast majority of the discrimination is directed at First Nations people. And that has very specific implications for us. Um, and we also know that the conditions that we're in has nothing to do with us nothing to do with our culture, nothing to do with our character. This is all about conditions that have been created and maintained by governments over time. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. So before I jump into what I'm going to talk about today, I think it's really important to set the context. I know a lot of you are already, you know, experts in this history, but I found that there's a gap between our knowledge about the history and how that links to where we are today. And I'm not just talking about the intergenerational impacts of things that happened in the past. I'm talking very specifically about things that are happening right now that are being layered on top of things that have happened in the past and how that uh, continues to multiply and make the crisis even worse. So I'm gonna to talk to you about kind of five key areas. The first one is the colonial context of Crown First Nation relations that set us up for where we are today. How the evolution of government policy specific to First Nations in particular um, have contributed to that. The role of genocide in today's socioeconomic conditions. And when I say genocide, I don't just mean historical, I mean ongoing. And what are the implications for all of these socioeconomic conditions in the current context of this COVID-19 pandemic? I mean, they're quite significant. And then how does systemic racism manifest in healthcare? Because that's another conversation that hasn't really been held a lot. Um, and it's not truly understood how racist beliefs um, within someone actually manifest as harm to an indigenous person. And then moving forward, how do we get out of this? And it's really a two pronged pathway. One is holding healthcare systems to account but the other is our own sovereignty and jurisdiction over healthcare, not just in our communities, but also within those healthcare systems. And you'll notice that I'll use some legally and technically specific language. I use the word Indian a lot because Indian policy is about Indians, the Indian Act, and you know all of the um, plans that were directed specifically at Indians. Obviously, when I'm talking about Indigenous peoples, I'm talking about the larger context of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. I only use the term Aboriginal if I'm talking about Aboriginal rights in Section 35 of the Constitution. Um, and the other thing I should say, and I'm not sure if this seminar opened up this way, but I want to also uh, offer a trauma warning because the issues that I'm going to talk about are very difficult. We're talking about lived experiences. We're talking about intergenerational lived experiences of racism, violence, and genocide. And so that can be 
uh, really upsetting. And I more than understand if people have to take a break or, or seek out supports for that, because this is really difficult. Um, but as difficult as this is, it's important that we hold those who are responsible to account. And we can't do that unless we call them on it. And so first off, I really want to talk about this colonial context. The fact that, you know, the historical context is really critical to understanding how we got here and how and why and in the many different ways that it continues. All of this injustice continues against First Nations because most of the conversations really focus on the past, which leads to this pushback to say, well, look, you already got an apology. It's in the past. Just get over it. But as First Nations know, it's pretty hard to get over something that's still happening. And so what we're saying is, yes, there's these things that happened in the past. They're still happening in the future. They just put different fancy titles on them. But it's the same core human rights abuses. It's the same core systemic discrimination. So, you know, in other words, what's happened in the past in terms of intergenerational trauma manifests in many different ways and layered on top of that are the new traumas and injuries that have devastating and very particular impacts on our health, our physical health, our mental health, our spiritual health, and then also our collective health. So not just as individuals, but how does all of these ill health conditions impact our collectives, our communities, our families, our nations that contribute to even more harm that doesn't originate from us and has nothing to do with us. And, you know, unfortunately, most of us, if you're my young age or older, uh, growing up in K to 12 education system, or even in colleges and universities, grossly misrepresented or completely erased or not covered at all, indigenous histories and and histories is the key because much of what has been taught about us is very much historicized even in some of the curriculum and content i see today it's about children reenacting things from the past reenacting cultural uh, aspects but not really acknowledging where we are today and the contributions that we make today and that includes not just general education but think about all of the education that goes into being a doctor a nurse an epidemiologist psychologist therapist any healthcare professional or any healthcare staff or anyone who writes the policies and practices in all of these healthcare institutions even as far as government goes. If, they're, if they don't know what's going on or they haven't been purposeful about caring to know the impacts of systemic racism on us, then that's what leads to the current problems. And like I said, for those that do teach it, I, I find a very disturbing trend about the historicization, the disproportionate focus on culture as opposed to our nationhood status, or the the message is softened or minimized so as not to upset anybody. And that really does an injustice to all of us and what we're facing in terms of systemic racism. Because if our children are old enough to suffer from systemic racism in education or healthcare or any of these other institutions, then other children are old enough to learn about it so that they don't repeat it when they're older. But it's also important to know that our Indigenous story, our Mi'kmaq, Wollastoque, Passamaquoddy, Gayankahaga story starts way before contact. And that's the most important story in all of it, this because it really helps dispel the myth that we need to confront today. So long before the violent colonization of Indigenous lands and bodies in what is now known as Canada, and from time immemorial in Mi'kmaq or Turtle Island, we lived as sovereign nations with our own sophisticated governments, our own political systems, our own complex legal regimes. We had really powerful trading networks. We had our own economies, our own manufacturing, well-trained militaries. We defended our territories. So this idea that we had no concept of what was, you know, our land to govern and protect, it, it, that's another myth. 
Um, we had our own, obviously, cultural traditions, our own practices, our own ceremonies and belief systems. Um, and it was varied. There is no mythical race of Indians. We all come from very different and diverse nations with our own languages and histories. And leadership also took a variety of forms and it changed over time. That's the other thing. We are not frozen in time. You cannot measure us by where we were in a certain point in history. Otherwise, we would we have never have evolved like any other society. And so our nations had powerful male and female leaders. We had leaders with gender diverse identities. We had women who served as negotiators, politicians. You know, we all contributed to our indigenous laws, the theories, the legal practices, how they would change over time. And that worked for thousands and thousands and thousands and many thousands of years. So we know that there is nothing wrong with us or our ways or our ideologies or cultures. These systems, keep in mind, were never extinguished just because Europeans came here and said, hey, yeah, I think we're just gonna declare ourselves sovereign. Um, because that's not how sovereignty works. There was no extinguishment, there was no conquering. And so our sovereignty, our self-determination, peoplehood, nationhood, whatever you wanna call it, that is still very much intact. But it's one of those things that we have to practice every day. And here's the other thing that relates specifically to this issue of health. If you look at all of the historical records of settlers and colonial officials and missionaries, they wrote about their meetings with Indigenous peoples, their observations of Indigenous peoples, that we were physically fit, we were muscular, and we were generally healthy in all the ways in which Europeans understood health, and we had very few chronic illnesses. Now, while practices varied, they also noted that we were physically active. We ate a variety, obviously, of country foods that came from hunting, fishing, gathering, but also from trade, also from farming, and that more recent settler you know, observations and archaeological studies showed that Indigenous peoples, especially in North America, had little, if any, dental cavities. We had, it was very rare that anyone had an instance of diabetes. We did suffer from instances of things like osteoarthritis or iron deficiency anemia in different places and some infectious diseases like strep or staph, you know, things that are common today. But for the most part, Europeans were blown away by our strength, our physical strength, our mental strength, and our spiritual strength, and just how holistic it was. And so of, if you look at all of those records, they will say that as a whole, First Nation or Indigenous health and, and the concept of health was supportive in that it was everybody's responsibility, not just the individual. It was communal in that one person's health also impacted the health of the community. It was holistic. It was done in a safe cultural context. Um, and because of that, they observed that the ways in which we treated illness and injury had a much higher rate of success and healing than their practices did. And that contributed to us as nations staying overall very strong and healthy. The other thing um, that, uh, you know, that I'm most proud of, and of course this varies from place to place because we have different plants that we use for different medicines, we have different practices, is that all over North and South America, if you look at all of the historical evidence on our own medical practices, so in addition to using different plants and herbs to treat different ailments and other practices, some of our medical practices were far more advanced than those of the Europeans. Think of the Inca, for example. The Inca had a far higher success rate at successful brain surgeries, an 80% success rate, than Europeans 400 years later, like Civil War doctors, had a far lower success rate for things like brain injuries and brain surgeries 
then did the Inca. And of course, all of our people shared their knowledges, you know, whenever we had contact with one another. And we also know today, I mean, finally, science has caught up that for things like um, burning sweetgrass, burning sage, all of our smudging ceremonies wasn't just for spiritual purposes because spirit is also connected to health, but it also has these medicinal practices, medicinal effects like um, eliminating 94% of all of the bacteria in the area. And it's the same with sweat lodges. There's health benefits for that. So it's important to understand that even though our practices are systemically looked down upon, systemically excluded and not included in healthcare, that in fact, science is now catching up to realize, oh yeah, really, they did know what they were talking about, but we can't wait for the science to back up what we already know through lived experience. And so for me, it's important to start this conversation right here with our story where we are strong, we're healthy, we're powerful, we're sovereign peoples. There is nothing inherently weak, fragile, or vulnerable about us, which means then that you have to work very hard for a very long time to try to chip away at this armor of health that we had. And that's exactly what's happened. It's not because of any weird biology that we have that we're in the situation that we are today. It is through purposeful and intentional government policies, practices, actions, and omissions that we're where we are today. Uh, we also can't ignore the impact of de diseases. So settlers brought with them diseases that we hadn't encountered before. And so if you look at the impact of those diseases on our people, Together with the impact of genocidal laws, policies, and practices, of course that's going to reduce our populations. But most of the history books focus almost exclusively on, oh, isn't that sad? You know, diseases came through nobody's fault. You know, our populations were minimized. And they really don't take you into account just how many people were impacted by, say, scalping bounties, for example, or any of the other genocidal laws and practices. So that's important to understand. And that's the story of where we are. And that's the context. I think that's where the conversation always has to start to preemptively dismiss any of those myths that we are a vulnerable population, we are weak or fragile. I don't know how many times I've heard that from hospitals and healthcare institutions. So we move forward then to government policy. The most important thing you need to know about government policy, there's a lot that's been written, there's a lot of research, but government policy has always been based on two objectives, pretty simple. One is that their, their primary objective was to acquire indigenous lands and resources, and I would put in brackets, our lucrative trade networks, and two, to reduce any financial obligations that they, had, they assumed by virtue of treaties, other agreements, or assuming jurisdiction over our lives. And here's the other really simple part about this. They only ever had two methods of doing that elimination or assimilation. Now, most of the conversation, most of what gets talked about in schools focuses on assimilation, but really ignores the significant impact on our health and our population numbers from elimination. And so people might be a little bit uncomfortable with that uh, historical reality for ones that don't know. But you have to keep in mind, there was a lot of really problematic people influencing what would eventually be Indian policy from the early pre-Confederation days right through post-Confederation into today. And some of those people were like Herman Maryvale in the 1840s, who presented a, a, a concrete plan for us. It was a four-part plan just exterminate us. And where that doesn't work, um, make us slaves. Where that doesn't work, segregate us and control us. And then for the few that remain, assimilate us. So imagine if the predominant thinkers are coming up with an Indian policy that's based on that, where it's basically get rid of the Indian problem at any cost. The Bagot Commission in the 1840s said the same thing. And oh, by the way, also get rid of treaty payments, displace indigenous nations into smaller communities so you can control them and separate kids from the parents. 
uh, because that will make sure we get rid of the, you know, any concept of uh, Indian resistance. And of course, the Penfather Commission, these are things that, you know, don't get talked about a lot, but this was strongly advocating dismantling all traditional forms of government because it's much easier to control under the Indian Act. And we know in the 1900s, I mean, I think everyone's heard by now, Duncan Campbell Scott saying, I want to get rid of the Indian problem. Our objective is to continue until there's not a single Indian left in Canada. And that was at any cost, including the death of our children. Because he also went on to say, he acknowledged that Indian children are dying at a much higher rate in residential schools, but this alone does not justify a change in the policy. Why? Because the ultimate policy objective was, and I quote, a final solution of the Indian problem. And despite the fact that there were lawyers saying, hey, you know what, that's kind of like manslaughter. When you are allowing all of these children to die, they proceeded anyway. And so this is really important historical context because we know that this Indian policy, acquiring our lands and resources, reducing financial obligations, was to be done at any price to be paid by us. And this policy has remained at the heart of Crown First Nation relations ever since. And that is where the National Inquiry really had impact in this society because it's like, no, this isn't just in the past. This is today. This is today. And, you know, you can look back at the historical policies. I mean, look at the liberal, liberal white paper on Indian policy in 1969 said, we're going to get rid of Indian status, get rid of reserves, transfer you to the provinces and just force assimilation into society. Of course, First Nations wholly rejected that and said, you cannot do that without our free prior and informed consent. And we have no intention of going away, nor do we um, agree to having our special status and rights taken away anytime soon. But don't think of this as just a liberal issue. My, my point here is that all of this has you know, gone the whole gambit of every level of government and every political stripe. Because in the 1980s, the Conservatives had what's been known as the Buffalo Jump, and that was a confidential memo to Cabinet, at least until it was leaked, to force Indians off reserves by reducing funding for housing, banned governance, and in particular, health care. And so the hope was that there would be so little services that they would have no choice but to move off reserve and voila, you would be under the jurisdiction of the provinces. Knowing full well that the provinces have long denied jurisdictional or financial responsibility for Indians, and so there would be this jurisdictional gap where we just don't get services because they don't want to have responsibility for people off reserve. And so we know what happened because of this Buffalo jump uh, plan, that it created a massive housing crisis that exists into today that impacts our health. There's a massive water crisis, which is far bigger than even reported in the Auditor General's report. And we know it contributed directly to the current health crisis because of the purposeful, intentional, chronic underfunding of healthcare to achieve political ends, i.e. reducing financial obligations to Indians on reserves by just forcing them off reserve to provincial jurisdiction, where provincial governments don't want to pay either. So all of this is happening despite the fact that there has been a subsequent protection for Aboriginal treaty rights in Section 35 of the Constitution. Governments continue to breach our Aboriginal treaty and land rights, knowing that we can't afford litigation. I mean, it's pretty hard. We can't afford health care to also be able to afford litigation. We know that our pre-Confederation treaties are a bit different than the numbered treaties, but there was a common theme in all of these treaties, that there was supposed to be mutual protection, mutual benefit, and aid when we needed it. That has been denied. We know, and we're getting closer to where we are today, during the dreaded 10 years under Harper, funding for social programs were not only capped, but funding was also cut, not just to First Nations uh, on the ground, but also to First Nations organizations, including those that provided healthcare services like mental health, 
child and family services, or other healthcare services. So we are nowhere near today, despite the election of Trudeau, of obtaining the actual costs based on our population increases, inflation, or the actual de needs or demands in health, which should be no surprise, is far greater than the general population because of everything I've just talked about. So this represents fundamental modern ongoing breaches of treaties, Aboriginal rights, Canadian laws, international laws, uh, you know, our own laws, and laws that are well well recognized in the international human rights system, whether it's the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the United Nations, and I mean, I could list 200 reports, but Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and the National Inquiry into Murder to Missing Indigenous Women and Girls also talked about all of this. So none of this is news, yet it continues. We could pass a hundred more laws tomorrow, but if we don't address the systemic racism, which is at the root of this, it's not that there's a lack of legal protection, it's that legal protection isn't afforded to us because of our perceived race as indigenous peoples. So we have a scenario where we could just keep doing studies. I mean, there is literally endless studies, commissions, inquiries, coroner's reports, inquests, and other investigations, but Canada's guilty of historic and ongoing genocide. That is the epitome of more than just systemic racism. That's with intention. So, and this is where people usually get stuck. You've got people who are, are prepared to accept some level of unintentional harms, you know, this unconscious bias that uh, allegedly exists that may have been done in the past. But what happened to Indigenous peoples was didn't happen exactly like the Holocaust, so it can't be genocide. That's usually stated by people who don't do genocide studies or don't understand genocide laws. Unfortunately, the Holocaust is undoubtedly one of the worst genocides to have ever been committed against people. It was horrific, it was wrong, and it'll have long lasting impacts. But the Holocaust is not the definition of, nor the standard for genocide. The UN Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide was adopted in 1948, but even before then, there was international recognition, uh, you know, under customary law, what genocide was. And so we know now we have this very specific law, and it says there's five ways you can commit genocide. Five. You only need to be guilty of one. And I say only, not disrespectfully, but only need to be guilty of one. So the first one is the one most people think genocide is, that you kill all the members of the group. Genocide is the intention to destroy in whole or in part a specific group. So no, you don't need to kill all the members of the group for a genocide to happen. But that's one of the ways in which genocide can happen. Number two is cre causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of a group. So now we're getting really close to healthcare in terms of you know, all of the conditions. Um, that's one of the ways. Number three is deliberately inflicting the conditions of life calculated to bring about their physical destruction in whole or in part. So think of literally what I've just been talking about, all of these conditions of life, the chronic underfunding, the stealing of our lands and resources, the herding us onto reserves, all of these things have come not respecting our Aboriginal and treaty rights, have had a direct impact on our physical and mental well-being. The other one is imposing measures that are meant to prevent births within a group. So think of things like forced or coerced sterilizations, think about forced abortions, um, and then the forcible transfer of children from one group to the other. So you think of the foster care crisis. The National Enquiry found, and, and it has been very upsetting to a lot of people, that Canada is not just guilty of one. Canada is guilty of all five, not just historic, but ongoing. That means we are in, a middle, in the middle of a crisis that is even more significant than the pandemic. It is the biggest human rights crisis that has ever faced this country, and it's the one that has received the least amount of attention. This report came out almost two years ago.
There is no plan to end genocide in Canada. Yet, there's statements in Parliament to call out genocide in other countries. Rightfully so, we should. But hello, we've got some genocide going on here in Canada. So this reality is really uncomfortable to sit with, primarily because it dispels two core myths that are foundational to our way of thinking in this country. The first myth is that what happened to Native people was this inevitable clash of cultures. And that's the reason for all of today's problems. And that's one of the reasons why too many reports focus on cultural awareness training to address the problem, as if the problem is our culture, and we know it's not. The other myth that this perpetuates is that Canada's policies have been well intended. You know, these great policies gone wrong. So there must have been something inherently wrong with Mi'kmaq people, Willis de Kwe, Gan Kahaga, Cree, and Anishinaabe peoples, because we tried to help and we just couldn't help them. Let me be very clear about this part. There is nothing wrong with us. There has never been anything wrong with us. This has never been about our culture. This has always been about clearing the lands so that settler governments can have our lands and resources and take all of the uh, power and wealth for themselves at any cost, including the historic and ongoing cost to our health, safety, and even our lives. And I know some will find it difficult to accept that, but um, that's not even debatable anymore. That was a finding of law and fact. And here's the other thing, if, if that's upsetting, is that you cannot be found guilty of genocide without the requisite intention to cause harm, to destroy Indigenous peoples in whole or in part. So think about Article 3 of the Convention. You can be guilty of <clears throat> committing acts of genocide, conspiracy to commit genocide, incitement to commit genocide, and attempt to commit genocide or complicity, sitting back and watching it happen. And I would make several arguments that Canada is guilty of several of those. So the TRC focused on the crimes and abuses that happened in residential schools and found that, and literally this is on page one, found that in all of its dealings with Indigenous peoples in Canada, Canada was guilty of genocide. That got almost no attention. Everyone wanted to kind of like race to the call to action. Hey, let's go to the apology and focus on what we're doing over here without really addressing all of the implications of genocide. And the TRC explained what they thought genocide was, that it, was, it, it did include mass killings, the preventions of births in Indigenous women, the destruction of Indigenous nations by trying to destroy our cultures, stealing our lands and resources, forcibly relocating us, tearing apart families and nations, and of course, the many deaths that happened in residential schools. But like I said, that didn't get a whole lot of attention. Despite the fact that in residential schools, we're talking about things that could be categorized not just as crimes here under domestic law and indigenous law, but crimes against humanity, as well as genocide. Children being apprehended en masse from families, starvation and neglect, medical experimentation, all of the abuse, and all of the forced labor. And we know that all of the things that happened in residential school has had a profound impact on our individual physical, mental, and spiritual health, those of our families, and our communities. So it's not like you can just treat individuals for this systemic-wide racism and systemic-wide genocide. We really need to unpack the implications of genocide, both in its historic and current forms, because of how it continues to today. And that's where we get to the National Inquiry into Murder to Missing, because they said Canada's guilty of historic and ongoing genocide. And some of their findings are very important. One, that Canada, when they're talking about genocide, they're talking about current actions and omissions to act as well as historic ones. So it's not just about going out and murdering somebody, it's also about making a decision that you know will lead to their premature deaths, which Canada does every single day. The other thing they said is that this form of genocide was race-based, it's 
systemically racist and, and Canada's entire system of laws, policies, practices, institutions, and even society has, is now fully ingrained this systemic racism. And we need to acknowledge that. And that Canada has demonstrated what they called a manifest pattern of conduct, which reflects an intention even today to destroy Indigenous peoples as Indigenous peoples. The focus is still on assimilation, integration, or now they call it inclusion, but it's all assimilation. And of course, they, I mean, they unpack this, there's a separate report, you should read it, but they said that Canada has displayed a continuous policy, remember I was talking about this Indian policy, where they change how they explain it, change the names on it. They say they have good intentions now, but ultimately they've never changed their steady intention to destroy us. That is one of the most profound findings that have ever been made in any of the reports that have ever come out. And it hasn't received enough attention because that directly impacts us on healthcare. And we know that Canada historically engaged in smallpox blankets, scalping bounties, mass murders, starvation policies, uh, forced sterilizations of Indigenous women and girls, residential schools, the 60s scoop. But you know what? All of these things continue under different forms today. I mean, even just calling it the 60s scoop. It's also the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010, 2020s. It's never stopped. In fact, it's gotten worse on all of those socioeconomic indicators, whether it be incarceration, uh, child care apprehensions, murder to missing Indigenous women and girls, um, health outcomes. You've got this you know, these charts that just continue to get worse and worse and worse, whereas society believes things are getting better and better and better. And that's the disconnect when people are talking about systemic racism. And so how does all of this manifest today in our current socioeconomic health outcomes? Um, A, uh, this legacy and current reality of genocide disproportionately impacts the health of First Nations people and in particular within First Nations people disproportionately impacts First Nations women and girl health. Um, and how does that happen? Well, over time, you've got this colonizing settler government that has built an infrastructure of racism, violence, misogyny, homophobia, ableism within all of its institutional laws, policies, practices, governing systems, economic systems, and of course, in society. Tell me that this has not been ingrained in society over time. Of course it has. Who do you think are the people doing the governing and writing the laws? They come from society and then they reflect these racist views back to society. And so this constant messaging system uh, has never been interrupted. And when we do try to interrupt it, there's like a massive pushback. I mean, look at the province of Quebec. They don't even want to acknowledge that systemic racism exists. I mean, it's, it's kind of like the conservatives having a vote that climate change doesn't exist. You cannot just vote away or believe away proven statistical evidence-based realities. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. And we also have to understand that this infrastructure of systemic racism in all of these institutions didn't evolve naturally. It was created by governments and institutions and is maintained by governments and institutions and some segments of society. So there's a real ongoing culpability here. Now, it's important that we you know, hold governments to account, federal, provincial, municipal, every government needs to be held to account of every political strike. This goes beyond politics. However, we have to understand that these ideologies are deeply rooted now in the institutions and agencies of government. Think of education, think of policing. Oh my goodness, we should just have a separate session on policing. And then of course, healthcare, but healthcare doesn't tend to get the big media attention that police going around and disproportionately shooting unarmed indigenous people do. And you know that is a crisis and we need to deal with that. Or the ways in which police uh, sexually abuse and physically assault indigenous women and girls on a disproportionate rate all across the country. Those things should get attention. 
but there's as many deaths, if not more, happening in the healthcare system that doesn't get the same amount of focus unless there's a video with, like with uh, may she rest in peace joyce eshaquan from quebec where she actually has a video an audio of the racism that's being directed at her instead of providing her with immediate health care supports and so um we're not going to find all of these smoking guns but the statistics certainly don't lie. So systemic racism has manifested in impoverished socioeconomic conditions. We know that today, 50% of all Indigenous peoples in care are Indigenous, but the majority of those are First Nations. And so that's kind of a problem too when we talk about global statistics. The Métis reality is not the same as First Nations and similarly not the same as Inuit. We have different conditions at different times based on different experiences and, and all of that. And we have to acknowledge that so that we can triage properly. Um, indigenous peoples are more than 30% of those in federal uh, prisons, but for Indigenous women, that's 44%. The majority of those are First Nations and provincial jails are higher. They can be as high as 80 to 100 percent Indigenous peoples, again the majority being First Nations. Indigenous youth corrections, 50 percent of all kids in corrections are Indigenous and in some provinces like Saskatchewan, Indigenous girls make up 90 percent of those in youth corrections. Come on! Tell me this is not systemic racism and tell me that that doesn't have a significant impact on her health and her health moving forward. We all know about murder to missing at this point, disproportionately represented in the missing, exploited, abused, trafficked, and murdered. We also know that Indigenous peoples are primary targets for racial profiling by police, police brutality, police sexual abuse, and of course killings by police at astronomical rates. We have a lifespan of 15 years less than other Canadians. 15 years, we're not talking about one or two years here. 15 years. It's no wonder then that our suicide rates can be as high as 10 times higher, but you have to look at each First Nation. Some First Nations in Ontario have held the highest suicide rate in the entire world for more than two decades. You don't really hear a lot about that. We suffer from obviously higher rates of heart attack, diabetes, and other chronic illnesses, three times higher. Preventable injuries are more than three times higher. We have higher rates of disabilities and mental health issues, no surprise there. And infant mortality is still three times higher. But let's just zoom in on epidemics, outbreaks, and pandemics because that's where it's like a triple quadruple whammy. So not only do we have this history and ongoing genocide against us, uh, systemic racism, misogyny, homophobia, all of these things, denial of services, chronic underfunding, but now add a pandemic to that and look at just take an outbreak like um, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is all but eradicated in Canada. But in First Nations, we have 40 times the TB rate than other Canadians. Still, today, for Inuit people, that's even worse. It's 290 times that. And we know that conditions like overcrowded housing, um, lack of access to water and sanitation, lack of access to equitable health care, quality health care, all of these things contribute to that. We know during H1N1, uh, that the stats that do exist because they aren't comprehensive for all areas of the region at all times. We know that First Nations were the most disproportionately represented in the H1N1 virus. We were 28% of hospital emissions. We were 18% of deaths in the first wave. We were, uh, in terms of the pregnant women being hospitalized, primarily First Nations women, and in course of uh, like in kids hospitals, like in the Winnipeg Children's Hospital, 55% of admissions from those children who had H1N1 were First Nations children. And so, you know, we have to look very particularly, we have to be focused, it's right to be focused, because look at the COVID rates today, and I never talk about health issues until I look, and every day I am checking the website. So Indigenous Services Canada posted the new COVID rate percentage today and COVID rates in First Nations all over Canada, 183% higher than the rest of Canada. 
And I was shocked when two weeks ago it was 73%. I was like, whoa, this is getting out of hand. It's more than going out of hand. And we know that, you know, populations of First Nations in Manitoba, Alberta, and Saskatchewan have the highest rates. I keep checking the Atlantic rates, and every time I see a week that has zero, 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 zero on reserve, I'm just continually thankful for all of the work and the, uh, you know, responsibility that First Nations took on themselves to protect uh, their communities. Um, and the Atlantic really stands out from the rest of the country in terms of both what First Nations and the provinces have done to try to limit the spread of COVID. However, there is a problem with the off-reserve tracking, uh, you know, off-reserve tracking and reporting. You don't see that by Indigenous Affairs. So more than half of our population lives off-reserve, and we don't see those numbers uh, posted like we do for First Nations on reserve. So we don't have a very clear picture of just how disproportionately impacted we are. Keep in mind the exceptionally high rates of institutionalization of First Nations people in youth corrections, foster care homes, prisons, jails, detention centers, mental health institutions, homeless shelters, rape crisis shelters, and domestic abuse shelters. Their risk of infection is so much higher because many of those institutions like youth corrections, prisons, and jails are notoriously overcrowded, are notoriously unsanitary, and of course they lack timely, adequate access to health care. I mean, that's no surprise. Read any report and it'll tell you about that. So that's a higher risk of transmission. And we did see early on that there were massive outbreaks in many of the institutions across the country, which is why we were calling for things like decarceration. Add to this all of the other structural factors that impact health, like the water crisis on reserve, the recent Auditor General report only talked about long-term drinking water advisories, not the short-term ones, or all of the problems with people who don't have running water at all, or who rely on wells or cisterns that are not operational. And the most recent analysis that just came out from the Institute of Investigative Journalism found that more than 15% of First Nations are forced to use cisterns. Those are like containers where trucks come and fill it up and that's where you access your water. Um, the research shows that they are more than twice as likely to be infected with COVID uh, those who use cisterns. And also when they looked at um, problems with cisterns, many of them had structural inequality. They can't hold enough water for one person in a week, let alone a family of four or 25 living in a house, and that they're often contaminated with organic material. And if you want to know what organic material means, that means rodents and snakes and other things that get into these cisterns. Now, I don't think anyone in healthcare would accept drinking that kind of water or having that kind of water in hospitals, so that shouldn't be allowed on First Nations. So although I'm talking to you very specifically about you know, healthcare, and I'm going to talk to you about how health, you know, racism manifests within the system of healthcare itself, it's important to remember that I don't have the time to talk to you about how housing contributes to that, how lack of water contributes to that, food insecurity, and all of the other structural and infrastructure contributions to ill health, but just know that that's the case. So it's even worse than I'm presenting here. But let's look specifically at healthcare institutions, and that includes Atlantic Canada. There is literally no province or territory that doesn't have the problems that I'm going to share with you today. We know from the healthcare system that education, training, the professional societies that represent doctors, nurses, psychologists, therapists, large hospitals, small hospitals, healthcare clinics, treatment centers, all of those who work in healthcare are implicated in this. It's, it's a serious issue. And the research that I'm drawing from is readily accessible. You can read the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the National Inquiry. You can look at all of the coroner's reports, inquests, special death reviews, and investigations into for deaths of First Nations in healthcare systems. I have some of them posted on my website. So all of this is backed by research. Um, and I post this stuff on my website because I think 
every single person that's even remotely connected to the healthcare system, whether they are a practitioner or someone who's developing the laws and policies or someone who just works there, all of this should be mandatory reading for everyone because these reports go way beyond the issue of so-called cultural awareness and they get to the heart of the problem, which is systemic racism. And that's on the healthcare system. That's not on us. And it results in human rights abuses. And so one of the reports I think everyone at this conference should read if you haven't already is the BC report that just came out. It's called In Plain Sight. They did a look at systemic racism in all healthcare systems in BC. Dr. Mary Ellen Terpel Lafon, she talked to more than 9,000 people. They reviewed 185,000 data sets and they logged more than 600 cases. And they were only looking in a short period of time. They weren't doing a massive like public inquiry like the TRC or National Inquiry. And here's what she found, which she also said is relevant to the, all the other provinces and territories. One, that there is widespread indigenous specific stereotyping, racism and discrimination in all of the healthcare system and that anti-indigenous racism is primarily anti-First Nation racism. She also found that racism limits access to medical treatments and negatively impacts the health and wellness of First Nations. That within that system, First Nations women and girls are even more disproportionately impacted. And that even Indigenous or First Nations healthcare workers have to work in this system of systemic racism and experience discrimination within their work environments. And she also noted that th this applies, like I said, to all the other provinces. And, you know, we can just talk about the anecdotal evidence, although there is some uh, research too, that most of us from the Atlantic region have personal stories or stories from our families where we were mistreated, uh, racist things were said to us, or we weren't treated at all, which is one of the major problems where we're refused treatment and that impacts our health. And so here's some of the common stereotypes that are held by people in the healthcare system. That indig Indigenous peoples, primarily First Nations, are less worthy of care, that they are presumed to be drinkers or alcoholics, they're presumed to be drug seeking, they're presumed to be bad parents. They're presumed to be something called frequent flyers, which means they're just misusing and abusing the healthcare system. That Native people are irresponsible and they don't take care of themselves, that they're less capable and the kicker, they get everything for free anyway. So these are commonly held stereotypes. And, you know, some of you might be thinking, well, you know, people can think what they want to think, but there's a big difference between people having that belief system and what happens to Indigenous peoples on the ground. But this report looked directly at how these racist ideologies translate into actual physical harm to First Nations people. So what happens is, is that because of these racist beliefs, um, there are unacceptable personal interactions between healthcare professionals and First Nations people, often rolling of their eyes, dismissing them, making racist comment, uh, comments. Um, number two, long wait times and denial of service much longer than compared to non-First Nation patients or they don't communicate with First Nation parents at all, or patients at all. They just go ahead and do what it is they're gonna do without actually talking to the First Nation person. Very common is not believing the health concerns of First Nations people or minimizing those concerns and making the assumption or accusing them of faking their symptoms. Uh, one of the biggest concerns that have come out, and this is prevalent in lots of places, is inappropriate or no pain management for First Nations at all under the assumption that they can take the pain, they're tough, or they're just trying to seek out drugs. And so we're going to make sure that they don't get it and then their pain is not managed. The other thing that really really upset me was the rough treatment 
by doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals, especially of First Nation women. So rough manhandling during exams, so rough in fact that it actually leads to physical harm and injuries. Imagine women going in for private examinations and coming out with physical injuries and horrible derogatory comments being said to them while this is happening. And of course, one of the most significant is medical mistakes and misdiagnoses because the people that are doing the healthcare don't take the time to look beyond their prejudice. They're assuming that patients are drunk or high and they don't take the extra steps to see, okay, how do we treat them for this situation, first of all? And secondly, do they have underlying health issues that we also need to address? And then finally, a complete lack of respect for cultural protocols and intolerance of families being with patients, uh, the number of families being with patients, or even things like hanging a braid of sweetgrass next to their bed. I mean, so these are all the ways in which racism goes from living in the head of a healthcare professional to manifesting as harm to First Nations people. And that's what people need to understand. It's a direct translation into harm. This isn't about political offense. So how do we address this? Because I'm getting you know, pretty close to the end of my time. Well, wow, what a big project to address it. But just because it's big, just because it's comprehensive, and just because it's difficult doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. It's all the more reason why we need to address it comprehensively, urgently and intentionally and set aside all of the pushback and denials because none of that matters anymore. What matters is making these changes. And so there needs to be substantive changes to healthcare in the Atlantic region, just like in other regions. Um, but the way to do that isn't only focusing on those healthcare institutions. To my mind, there's two paths. One, we need to hold those institutions and all of the systems that feed those institutions to account. We have to also strengthen First Nations jurisdiction and governance over our own health care. And so we've got this bigger project of holding Canada to account to genocide, but we also have this path that's specific to health care and holding them account to systemic racism and the harms that are um, portrayed and um, abused um, against Indigenous peoples. And of course, of course, all of the ways in which the healthcare system and governments are responsible to help strengthen First Nations jurisdiction and governance over our own healthcare. It's essentially, that's the only way we're going to address racism in healthcare because we know some institutions will fight change tooth and nail. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. So in terms of addressing racism specifically in healthcare, there are tons of recommendations from RCAP, TRC, National Inquiry. You can read all of those. Uh, the recommendations are much smaller than the reports. But don't forget about this BC report. It should be included in your considerations in this conference for future changes for all of these institutions to really look at and say, what are these things that we can adopt? Because it's unique from other reports in that it critiques other reports and the same recycled recommendations that are made over and over, like cultural awareness training, cultural sensitivity training. Um, and that's not to say our culture is not important. People should know and respect our culture. But our culture isn't killing us. Their systemic racism is what's killing us. So the urgent priority is on addressing what's actually killing us. But instead, the focus has all been on us, as if there's some problem or misunderstanding of culture that leads to a denial of service. And that's not the problem. We see very clearly that it's about the racism. So the other thing she says, and I think it's just so fundamental, her biggest recommendation is the implementation of recommendations. I mean, think about it. How many reports do we have with thousands of recommendations on everything under the sun and governments and institutions like healthcare simply don't implement them or they cherry pick the most superficial, easy, comfortable 
recommendations and so they can tick boxes and say oh well we have a diversity and inclusion program or we have an indigenous people's day or you know we do one hour training once every two years and you know you're ticking all these boxes meanwhile they're not measuring if that's having an impact they're not holding people to account when the the racism does happen and the harm does happen so we need to go well beyond the superficial and that's not to say the superficial isn't important it is but it's only part of the bigger package so first of all, we need current education and training programs to address just how woefully inadequate they are. There's little, if any, education on cultural safety, not cultural awareness, but cultural safety in a First Nation context, uh, First Nation specific health. Um, First Nations specific racism, how to identify it, how to address it, how to remediate it, how to hold people to account. There's no mandatory training or evaluation of the training that exists out there other than participant feedback like, oh yeah, that was nice training. Well, has it led to any results? Are you measuring that? And no, the answer is clearly no. And another problem is there's no real centralized accountability. And, um, and that's a real problem. The other issue is that the complaints process in the current healthcare system, and this includes Atlantic Canada, does not work well for First Nations people. It's not easily accessible or well known, even for lawyers who are trying to help clients. There's little space for culturally specific and supported resolution of complaints. Uh, complaints are rarely, if ever, meaningfully addressed. And, and that's key, rarely if ever meaningfully addressed. And the complaint process often reproduces the very same systemic racism, harm, and trauma that's being complained about to begin with. The other issue is that Indigenous health practices and knowledge are not adequately integrated into the healthcare system in a meaningful, comprehensive, and consistent way. You might find little patches here and there once in a while, depending on who's working, who's tolerant and who isn't, but nothing that's comprehensive. Um, and of course, real no recognition of Indigenous authority or agency in their own health. Um, and there is insufficient hardwiring of Indigenous cultural safety throughout the BC healthcare system, but also um, Dr. Tapelafon said that this is reflected right across the country, that there is a real lack of intentional, meaningful embedding of Indigenous cultural safety and purposeful anti-Indigenous action, or sorry, anti-racist, anti-racism action, not just we're not racist and we stand against racism. Where's your anti-racism action? What is it that you're doing to make sure how are you measuring that how are you holding people to account so you see there's a similar theme here um and of course a real lack of accountability the higher you go up the chain in professional societies um heads of departments of surgery um you know unions that represent all of these groups you see a real lack of accountability uh or impetus for change beyond the superficial and we have to address that as, un as uncomfortable as it is to hear and basically where are where's the infrastructure where are the laws policies and practices that will focus on and be successful in eliminating all forms of anti-First Nation racism, from the complaint process to education to collection of data, you know, quality improvement, monitoring of progress, all of that. It simply doesn't exist. It simply doesn't exist. And so, you know, I mean, Dr. Drupal Lafon, she recommends going forward with this, that everyone involved in this process has to recognize that anti-First Nation racism in healthcare is a lack of respect for the indigenous right to health. Not just respecting indigenous culture, but really a breach of and lack of respect for our legal right to adequate non-discriminatory health care. And that's the key here. Because what's happening, it's not just systemic racism, it's against the law. And that racism is so integrated with society and all of the institutions that we have to look at all of the feeder groups to the healthcare system. And of course, 
Um, whose voices should be centered in all of this? Yeah, First Nations voices need to be centered. And so she had like a ton of recommendations. There's a ton in RCAP. Um, there's some in the TRC, some in the National Inquiry, but we have to go beyond apologies. We have to make sure that every single one of the laws, policies, training, uh, accountability, measuring data conforms to the ind Indigenous or First Nation right to health that's recognized everywhere, including in UNDRIP, that there needs to be an ombuds pers person in every region uh, and particularly in every province, especially in the Atlantic region, to make sure that there is a culturally safe place to address all of these concerns and to have the power to make sure that there are, we are able to remediate the problems. So look at the calls to action in the TRC and the National Inquiry and all these other reports, but please read this BC report. Um, because the other path, uh, and that's the one that uh, I work on with First Nations, is the one about First Nations jurisdiction. In addition to all of the, you know, holding the healthcare system to account, the other path forward, and it's one of the root causes, is the denial of the recognition of our jurisdiction. So we can't forget that it is equally important to acknowledge, respect, implement, support, and enforce First Nations lawmaking, jurisdiction, and governance over our own health care as individuals, families, communities, and nations. I mean, that's literally paramount. Our laws are paramount in this territory. And so we've got to start right from there. And so basically what I'm talking about is literally implementing First Nation self-determination over our own health care. And that includes not just on reserve through Indian Act structures. We, oft, we often focus only on on reserve. That includes jurisdiction over our off-reserve members as well. And at the nation-based level, at the Mi'kmaq Nation or the Wolastaque Nation level. And that we are not just in control of healthcare within our communities, but also as decision makers in all of the healthcare institutions set up by federal governments, provinces, or even um, local areas. That we have a right to be decision making makers in all of these contexts. So, you know, and, and this is a equally important because we have been so disempowered and not listened to and ignored. I mean, our voices have been effectively erased from the solutions that would greatly improve our socioeconomic conditions. Uh, there's systemic racism in the justice system. So it's hard to even go to Canadian courts to try to get resolution for what's happening in healthcare because of this unresolved systemic racism there. I mean, time and time again, wherever you see these problems, you see in First Nations not being meaningful decision makers. I don't mean being consulted as a stakeholder or an, or an interest group or having some level of accommodation made. I mean, free prior and informed consent with the recognized authority to make our own laws and our own decisions in all of these contexts on and off reserve. And of course, we see very few First Nations people in senior positions within the healthcare system to help bring about these changes. And all of this has to change. And it has to change whether or not the Conservatives are in power, the, um, you know, liberals are in power. It doesn't matter who's in power. It, like, this isn't about elections. This isn't about any of that. And it's certainly not about whether the provinces or Canada adopts UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. That's the standard anyway, whether they adopt it or not. And so it's always been against the law to be racist and discriminatory in the provision of health care. And so we just need to get at that. We, we don't need to you know, be distracted by whether or not all of these other political things are going to happen. It's no longer a debate. First Nations are still targeted for systemic racism. Our laws are sovereign based on our sovereign powers to govern our people. Our treaties acknowledge our status as sovereign nations. Section 35 recognizes our inherent right to be self-determining, UNDRIP, is a recognition of the international standard that recognizes our right to be self-determining. And that includes the right to construct 
and govern our own systems internally within our First Nations and within state institutions like healthcare institutions. So we can't forget that other part. And then we have the right to adequate health care without discrimination. So any path forward has to be on that path where we're holding those to account, but also recognizing our agency. And that means we have the same power. And I know that's going to be uncomfortable. And I know it's going to just be very disruptive uh, because it means a transfer of wealth, a transfer of power and making space or taking space where it is not offered. And we're going to face pushback. But the deeply ingrained status quo of systemic racism continues to kill our people, and we simply have no choice. We have a human right to health care without racism, and I think that's what we need to do. And the real core solution is First Nations assuming um, and asserting their sovereignty over this area. And one of the ways I'll, my concluding remark will simply be I, my hope, my glimmer of hope is how I've seen First Nations, including First Nations in the Atlantic region, respond to the pandemic. You know, we, of course, held the governments to account that, you know, we were entitled to supports, but we also took our own actions and we kept our own communities safe and we kept our own people safe. And all of the things that First Nations did in the Atlantic region across the country and the tribal governments in the U.S., that's sovereignty and self-determination in action. And that's how we're going to make sure that we change our health outcomes in the future. So to me, that's, that's where an equal amount, if not more focus has to be. And I honestly believe we'll do it. We'll get dis, you know, pushed back and discomfort and denial, but uh, we just don't need to focus on that. So thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. I know this was long. I literally had hours and hours and more things to say, but um, I'm trying to fit within the hour and 15 minutes. But <laughs> Candy, I'm sure, is going to chair questions if you have any questions, and I'll try to not be long-winded in the questions. I am. I think first I'm going to uh say that you could assume there was a standing ovation even though people have no pants on and they're at home. <laughs> I was watching the comments and everybody was like so feeling it. I'm going to answer the first question for you because everybody asked, can we see this again? Can we see this again? Yes, this has been recorded. So it will be on the APC website. So we can all go and watch again and again and again. And we can take notes just like we're in Dr. Pam's class. <laughs> and, you know, who knows? Maybe you can actually go to Ryerson and audit the class. That could happen too. But we have one uh, question that came up uh, quite a few minutes ago that I want to put to you, which is this. The federal government is looking at developing addressing systemic racism legislation. What advice would you give to Indigenous people if they work on this with the federal government? Okay, I have several feelings about this. One, that if Canada were to abide by, implement, and enforce the current laws we have in this country, including Indigenous laws, we would not have murder to missing, we would not have racism, we would not have over incarceration, we wouldn't have the problem. So although we put a disproportionate focus on the law as the solution, um, if they don't implement it or respect it or interpret it in a, in a bad way, that's not going to help us. That being said, however, um, I'm always leery of First Nation or, or federal lit um, legislation because they don't truly co-draft. They say they co-draft, but that's not how it works. I, I did 10 years hard time in the feds. I worked at uh, Justice Canada. I'm fully rehabilitated kind of, I've got some issues, but I mean, the way legislation is drafted is it's a French speaker and an English speaker sitting alone in a room. Not even government officials are there telling them what to write. They are the ones that are writing it. And it's the policymakers in government that decide what are going to be the key elements. They may consult or engage with, you know, the AFN or something like that, but that's not really co-drafting and it's and you notice there that it's not first nations having the agency or authority in that that's us being a participant you know provided money for consulting so i'd be very careful about that before that legislation even starts being co-drafted i think first nations should decide for themselves what needs to be in there and what doesn't so that it doesn't end up like the Languages Act, the Child Welfare Act, the UNDRIP Act, where you say a whole bunch of nice things in the whereas clause, but there's no sections that you can take to court if they don't abide by. Excellent. 
I, I see another question here, but I want to address, I see a lot of people saying, you know, I'd like to show this presentation to nursing students. I'd like to show this presentation to this, that, and the next thing. Here's what I want to say about that. We are Indigenous women who are independent contractors. Yes. And if you want nursing to have that, why should they get all that Pam spent, I don't know, must have been 20 years because there's four degrees there, uh, learning, why should they get that for free, right? They should hire Pam to go and give that presentation. It, 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 should, it should not always be that our information, our knowledge goes free to them, yet we pay for everything that comes this way. So please yeah. be, be cautious of that because you want to support Indigenous women, you want them to pay for what they're getting. And so I just Candy Yes. Can, I, can I just, you know, add one really quick thing to that? There's a real danger in just showing a video to people and not having a discussion with the Indigenous person who actually gave that information to answer questions, misunderstandings, um, so that it's just, there's actually no learning from it. You just watch it or pretend to watch it or listen to something else. It's it's a huge difference when the Indigenous person is there like I am right now to answer questions mm. and set people straight because you know how people will just kind of slightly misinterpret something and so that's a real danger. Good point point. and there's a question here that I think looks really interesting. Is the buffalo jump plan in your opinion still in effect and maybe disguised as something else? Yes. Yes, so all of these are different iterations of the white paper policy. Just cut funding, try to get them off reserves. Tell me that they're not doing that now with not funding housing, where are we supposed to live? Like Candy and I have no choice to live off reserve. That's not saying we would have, but we have no choice because there is no funding. And so that continues today. And even under the Trudeau government, even though he increased some of the funding that Harper cut, it's never been brought up. It's still strategically underfunded. And look at how they're fighting Cindy Blackstock at the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. There are 10, you know, non-compliance orders into it. They're fighting now not to give compensation to kids who are in foster care. Tell me, that that is not going to impact our health, safety, and well-being. So yes, of course, they can say all the nice things they want, but it's the 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 proof is in the action. Show me the money, folks. Show me the laws. Show me the respect, and they haven't done that. Now I acknowledge that you know we could probably have question and answers for the rest of the day, um, but presenter or uh, participants, I want to take a moment to take off my formal uh, hosting hat. And I want to share a little observation with you. I'm going to try to do it without getting emotional. Um, Pam and I, you may not know, are first cousins. And our grandmother, this is her. Mm. Our grandmother was put out on the street with her children because she had married a white man from the United States. And when he left, they put her on the street. And she had five children plus one unofficial adoption. And her children included Pam's father, Frank, and my father, Guy. And she took those children into the bush in a tar paper lean-to, and she made this, which is the draw knife that she made herself and that she used to make baskets and high chairs and snowshoes to sell to the white people in town to keep our fathers alive and fed. And she did that. Now, our grandmother and our fathers are passed on to the spirit world. But I just wanted to take a second to say how incredible it is that two of our granddaughters are well-educated, well-known, and influential women across this country. So everything that Dr. Pam said today about how they tried to end us, they tried it on our grandmother, and Pam and I are here to say it didn't work. I just really want people to understand that, how incredible it is that she and I are here doing what we do because they really did a number on our grandma. Ooh. Sorry, I didn't mean to make you cry too, but I thought it would be great for people to just understand that and see how like a single woman, a single indigenous woman in the 1930s and 1940s with this simple tool that she made herself kept her kids alive and that resulted in Pam and I. So I just really wanted to take that moment to honor that because you and I are never in the same place at the same time. Never. And so I just wanted to really share that. And on behalf of all the participants, because I can certainly see it,
Um, thank you so much, not just for your passion, but for your incredible intelligence and your knowledge on all of these things. It was, you know, we could have listened to you all day and it was really an honor for me as your cousin to sit here and listen to this. So thank, thank you so much, Pam. Love you so much. Thank you, Candy. I love you and miss you and miss everybody even more. I knew as soon as I saw a familiar face, it was going to be the end of me and it already is the end of me. So. All right. Sending lots of love. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks to all of our listeners and viewers for once again tuning into the Warrior Life podcast and for all of your support. And thanks to all of you who have ever been a part of Candy's life. And you can all be part of honoring Candy's legacy by logging on to the Day of Pink Honor Candy website. And I'll make sure to post the link in the description box below. At this link, there's different actions that you can take. You can make donations to Native women's organizations instead of flowers. You can sign Candy's letter demanding that Canada finally fulfill all of the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and all of the calls for justice from the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls. You can also share your stories and photos that you might have of Candy. And... You can also choose to attend her celebration of life that'll be happening sometime in the near future. Thanks again to all of you who have ever supported Candy in any way. Till next time, keep living a warrior life just like Candy did. Walaliug.